Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Today's guest was brought up in the British West Country before moving to the States to pursue her career. She has worked as a global executive search leader for 15 years, climbing the corporate ladder to senior director level. My guest decided to take a break from her corporate lifestyle and spend a year of her life living with different communities and subcultures. In those 12 months, she lived with 26 different subcultures, battle reenactors, circus performers, Morris dancers, naturists, train spotters, zeitgeist political activists, and that's just a few. She went on to document those experiences in written form with the publication of her book, A Year in the Life, Adventures in British Subcultures. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by a woman of many guises, a corporate businesswoman, an author and blogger, a social tourist, and a family woman with a young child. We talk about the corporate world, a year in the life and her travels, a nearly fatal motorbike accident, the success and publicity from a book, and being a mother. Lucy Leonelli, a warm welcome to your take. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for sharing your, your story over the, the next 60 minutes. We've obviously got so many areas to, to cover of your kind of, your life story and what you've done during your career and, and outside. And I kind of wanted to cast the clock back at the beginning from the present back to the, the kind of very beginnings, as I said, your roots. I kind of wanted to find out, ask, where and when you were born and what are your memories from childhood and do you have siblings? Okay, so a lot to unpack there. So I was born in Bristol in a place called Whitchurch, which is a little village um, in 1985, which dates me. And I have a sibling, an older sister, who is, uh, I'll date her as well, turning 40 this year, who has three young kids. And I, early memories from childhood, I remember being, I talk about this in the book a lot, being like a, a kind of an eclectic mess of a human being as a child, as in I had so many different things that I was interested in, different hobbies, different like explorations of who I wanted to be particularly during the teenage years um you know I was like a a goth for like a few weeks and then I was like a skater for a few weeks and then I was uh, a cool kid for a while and just kind of veered off in all these different directions was always pretty precocious um as a kid as well loved old music my well I say old at the time I guess they weren't that old like my favorite band were Queen and you know even as like a 10 year old that was my favorite group so um yeah stand-up memories were just doing lots and lots of different things and having lots of different hobbies we share some common things both coming from the west country we're both brought up in the the same city and I like kind of what you said already about the different guises during your kind of early childhood and kind of look into the past for some of your influences. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come on and kind of ask about your, your parents and ask who are they and what did they do for a living? And do you come from a, a close family? Yeah, I do come from a close family, uh, a small family. We were always a very small family unit. So my parents um, both lost their parents very young. So we have a few cousins, um, but a lot of them live in other places in Australia and the US. So it was a, definitely a very small family unit. My mother growing up was in, had a, a few different jobs, but landed in her specialty really, which is education. So she was a teaching assistant, 
She um, worked for a children's hospice for a while, and she worked with children that had behavioral difficulties. But she took a lot of time off uh, out of her career to raise us when we were very young. And then my father owns a logistics business. So he moves things around the world, ships things around the world, which has been very busy during COVID times. But that's always kind of on and off what he's done. Interesting portrait on your, your early life, your upbringing and the background on your, your parents. I kind of wanted to move on to your schooling and ask you where you were schooled and were they particularly, sorry, particularly happy times in your early life? And were you naturally academic? And did you go to on to further education after leaving school? Sure. Yes, I uh, I thought it was pretty academic. Yeah, I went to a local primary school and a local um, comp and at the year eight to year nine point was um, got into a, a, a private school, Bristol Grammar School, which you may know. Um, do, yeah. And yeah, so it kind of had to take a test to get into that school and was was having to like go ahead with books and things before. So it made sense for me to move there. And that was a and it was a great experience. Actually, honestly, every school I went to was a great experience. I loved, I've loved all of the schools that I've been to. Um, but I think the move from my local school to um, Bristol Grammar School, BGS, was kind of um, shifting for me because it was, a re- I was, the, the, the social pressure in the first, my first school was to be the norm, right? Was to be like everybody else. And if you were a little bit weird or quirky or outside of that, it definitely wasn't celebrated. You were kind of forced to, you know, we kind of bullied for that, honestly. Whereas Bristol Grammar School, the second school I went to, it was encouraged and celebrated to be a bit different. In fact, honestly, the quirkier you were, kind of the cooler you were, it was a strange, like if you had very different things that you like to get involved in or different taste in music or just taste in clothes. It was kind of celebrated and encouraged. And we did a lot of, um, a lot of extracurricular activities and things, which was just incredible for me. So that side of my personality that I described before, the wanting to try on all these different versions of myself was celebrated in my second school. So that really kind of brought me out of my shell. was like, it's okay to be like this. It's cool to be like this. And, And it's encouraged and gave me a lot of confidence. I wanted to move on now and discuss your working and professional life and talk about the very beginnings and did you have career aspirations and if so what was your plan to achieve those goals? So yes I did have career aspirations um again eclectic I wanted to be a Blue Peter presenter for a while I wanted to be a dolphin trainer I wanted to be an environmental lawyer, but the thing I really honed in on was politician. I wanted to change the world. And that was, so my um, education really pushed me in that direction. I did political philosophy at university. For my A-levels, I did philosophy, psychology. I just really wanted to to go in that direction. Mm. And then I um, interned for an MP in Devon. I went to university in Exeter. So I did did go on to... um, to uh, continue my education into university. So I went to Exeter and I worked for a local MP there and was going door to door canvassing for him and realized pretty quickly that I didn't know enough to be a politician. I didn't have any life experience. You know, we would ask people, what's bothering you right now? What do you think that this particular uh, politician can help you with? And it would be things like, you know, taxes. And just, I had no life experience of paying taxes to this extent. Like it just made no sense to me that I would have an opinion and, and at that point be um, effective as a politician. So my plan then was to go and get some life experience and then come back to that later in my life, which I don't think I'll do now. I think I was, um, I think I was very opinionated as a, a teenager, as I think a lot of teenagers are. And actually as I've grown up and particularly um, the experience of writing the book, it kind of opens you to the extent that it's quite hard to have strong opinions. <laughs> yeah, you you realize that there is always a different perspective and there is always a different side to the story and that actually the truth is almost always in the middle, in the gray area that's uncomfortable and we don't want to sit mm. there as human beings. But um, that's what I kind of realized and I'm still in that space now. So I don't know really if I could be a politician. I just don't feel like I have a strong enough 
stance on things to go drive things and make them happen. You've worked for a, a corporate headhunting firm now for a decade or so. Can you give us some details on the, the companies you've worked for and your roles within them? Mm -hmm. And how did you eventually become a partner in the firm you currently work for? Sure. So I've actually since moved on since then, but I was at that firm for a long time, for 13 years. Um, so I fell into exec search is what I do. So executive recruiting. Um, I fell into it completely, as most people do in the recruitment world. I didn't know, aside from wanting to be a dolphin trainer and a Blue Peter presenter at that point, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just wanted to go out there and learn business, get some experience in business um, and build a network um, and earn some money, frankly, at the beginning, you know, the student in debt, you need to, you need to pay some of that off. So headhunting just felt like a great path for me because it ticked those boxes. It's the opportunity to learn about business from that kind of top level down, you can earn some money and um, you build a network of executives. So it just made sense. So I, Ticked a lot of boxes, fell into it. That was 13 years ago. I think I got headhunted from a graduate recruitment program by the firm that I work for. We were a very small firm when I joined. We grew um, pretty dramatically while I was at that organization over the course of, um, of, of 13 years. And what we did is executive level searches for our clients who are technology and professional services firms. So Deloitte, for example, was a big client of ours. We would, when they needed a new partner for their healthcare practice, we would go out there and actively headhunt candidates for that role. So approaching their competitors, seeing if anybody was interested in making that move. And the same for technology firms. So we did that. Um, it was a great experience. I, I love my time in that organization. And I actually got to move to the US um, on the back of, of, with that firm. So I came and was the first person on the ground in the US to start up our US arm. So that was an incredible opportunity. And then uh, now I do the same role, but for in-house. So for a firm called Twilio, which is a big technology firm. So I run our internal executive recruiting mm. team. I wanted to talk about the transition of being brought up in, I suppose, a reasonably small city um, here in the UK, Bristol, and then moving out to America and making that dramatic change in your life. Was that kind of a, a hard thing for you to do at the time or were you just relishing the the opportunity to go to a different culture go to a, a different country and land a, a very good senior position and role yeah it was both I guess intimidating and exciting for me um I did go via London so I actually for my the firm the exec search firm I worked for for a long time was always in London so I was in London for eight years and actually London is you know, an enormous city. And surprisingly, Bristol is about eight, 850,000 population wise, something like that. San Francisco, which is where I now live, is a similar population. So although America is enormous, the city itself does have that kind of small city vibe. Yeah. Um, but it, so scale wise, yes, they're similar, but it is, um, it's a very different world out here. It's a very different culture. It's Silicon Valley. So I'm at the heart of um, technology bubble, um, which I'm now part of. So the great piece of that, though, is um, I'm sure we'll get onto my book in the kind of experience of lifting the lid on different subcultures. I got to do that here, which was an incredible experience just to like discover this whole new world people that have a they don't speak a different language literally but they do use different words right in the us and there's just a different kind of way of oper operating lots of acronyms a very kind of positive go get them entrepreneurial culture which can spill into i guess the overplayed strength of that is it can spill into sometimes a lack of authenticity um so you know the british no filtered say what's in your head um, can be quite cynical, I think, certainly compared to here, um, is just so, so different to the, hey, how are you? Everything's awesome, which is what you get in the US. So building friends, making friends out here, I found really difficult because I just assumed that, you know, the barista was my best friend because she was being so nice to me. <laughs> The reality of it, of it is that's just the culture here and there's, it's, it can be more difficult to build those real deep connections is what I found. 
I think this is a, a timely moment to move on to a significant and different chapter in your life. Mm-hmm. You moved away from the, the corporate world, the kind of hustle and bustle, the, the nine to five, the stress of the stress and responsibility of working in that kind of, I, I guess, normal world. You decided to take time out of your working life to spend a year living with different groups and subcultures. What did your employer think when you told them? Had this been a long-term plan? And did did the decision impact you financially? Mm. It absolutely wasn't a long-term plan. Although the long-term plan was never to be in recruitment. So after that long of being in recruitment, um, I don't think it came as a huge surprise that I wanted to do something a little different. Um, The surprise was more to friends and family who couldn't really understand why I would leave a, you know, well-paying established career that I was very lucky to have to go and do something kind of crazy um, and and off the beaten track. So that was the, that was the tension. I think my bosses got it. Honestly, they, they knew me and they got it and they got that, that I, when I sold them on the idea of what it was that I wanted to do, it made a ton of sense. And actually there are crossovers between when you're an executive search, you spend most of your day meeting people and interviewing people and trying to understand their lives. So for me to want to do that for a year in book form was, was not a huge leap, albeit I threw the towel in and, and obviously didn't get paid for that year. So, um, so it was a, a bit of a shock, um, but I think some people got it. To some people, it was very strange. Um, and financially, yes, it was. I, I was very, very aware that, you know, it is a very entitled, lucky thing to do to be able to take a year out to, to do something like this. Um, so I'd saved. I'd been saving constantly, always kind of lived dramatically under my means so that I could go do something like this or just escape the rat race at some point was always the plan for me. So I had been doing that and was therefore able to just tap into that resource while I was having this year out to write the book. How long did it take to plan and prepare your journey? And how did you go about documenting your experiences? And how did you go about contacting each group and introducing yourself? And the the kind of final thing I wanted to ask you Were any groups less accommodating and did any turn down your offer? Okay, I will try and remember all of those questions, but I may have to come back to you. So um, how long did it take me to plan? Luckily, I had a six month notice period at work. So when I said I want to have a year out, that kicked off my six month notice period. So I did have quite a lot of time to plan for this. I went and did a I'd never written before other than writing essays at university and so I wanted to learn to write because I always knew I wanted this to be a book it was a and not just a a kind of gap year like a quarter life crisis where I just went and did something else I wanted to capture the experience and have something to show for it and really find a way to give it some structure so to me it was always going to be a book but I didn't just want to write a book that you know was almost like a diary that no one was ever going to want to read so I had to learn to write so I went to um did a course at City University on narrative and nonfiction writing, which is the genre. Um, so I did that. And then I also had to figure out what I was going to do. So 26, beautifully, 52 weeks at a year, 26 letters in the alphabet. I had a week on and a week off. So I did a week of living, 26 weeks of living with these groups and 26 weeks of writing up those experiences. It, it didn't fall quite as beautifully as that because... It was also a dance of trying to spend the time with the groups during a significant festival or or, or time of their year where they all came together. As you can imagine, a lot of things happened in the summer. Um, P was for pagans, summer solstice. I knew I had to be there for that. Um, That clashed with some other big events uh, in the battle reenacting community, for example. So what I did was made a huge spreadsheet, went through every letter of the alphabet, thought of four or five different options for each letter. Some lend themselves to more options. Some are really tough. (laughs) Surprisingly, um, J, like there are hardly any subcultures that begin with J, Q, Z, X, 
some were really, really tough. Um, so I, I did have a bit of creative license with some of those letters. Um, but then I, so I came up with all these options and then I researched what was going, how would I infiltrate these communities? So was it just, you know, going along to an event and hoping that I would meet people? Was it trying to reach out to the groups in advance to, to plan a way that I could go and join in Morris dancing? For example, I had to find a group to go and, and join their practices and, and become a member so that I could then dance out with them and just really learn about the community that way. So I had to figure it all out, figure out all the different options, figure out how to make that work with the different times of year. Dog showing for D, Crofts. I had to go to Crofts, right? That's the only thing you can do for dog show. The biggest thing, the biggest event in their year. So I did that. And then the way that I um, infiltrated, sounds negative, doesn't it? But the way that I um, managed to kind of immerse myself in these groups and, and meet these people was reaching out directly. Again, it's kind of what I did for a living was, you know, doing some research, finding people and just having the guts to kind of cold call them or find their email addresses, research as to how I could get hold of them, DM them on Twitter, whatever it was, find a way of getting hold of them, email the press secretary of certain groups. Um, and then if I couldn't access them that way, I had a lot of success at writing. So Arist letter A was aristocracy. I wrote to like the queen, every member of the royal family you could think of. I sent out like 300 letters just to say, hey, can I come and hang out with you for a week? Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of no's, but you've got to throw a lot of stones for one to stick and, and a few of them did stick. So there was that. And I also posted a lot of, um, does anybody know anyone in the X community Facebook statuses? Just to my network of friends. And it is really surprising, not necessarily who I know, but who they know. So like the mm -hmm. secondary and kind of tertiary connections of people were how I got introductions. So A, for example, I, my connection there was my boss's wife's friend's aunt, who was a who was a marchioness. So I spent time and lived live with her for a week. So that was just a case of asking as many people as possible in hope that they can then connect you with somebody who then may know somebody. But it's just amazing how many of my friends knew circus performers, for example. Um, so that's the way I did that. And then there was one final part of the question. Yeah. That I meant. I yeah, I was going to ask, were there any groups you approached who, yes. yeah, decided not to accommodate you or turn down your offer to be, join, join them or join part of their experience, a, a kind of along your journey? Yeah, well, there were, um, I did want to do the Hells Angels for H and it ended up being hill bagging, which was actually a much better choice in the end because they were great. Um, so the Hells Angels were, were very challenging to, to, uh, to infiltrate. So I went to their, the other Bulldog Bash, their big event and spoke to a few people, but they, they just weren't, they weren't willing. I think they've been burnt before by journalists and weren't willing to, they're very democratic as a group and they had a vote and, and the vote was that they didn't want to be included in the book. So that was, that was a challenge. I persisted quite a while, but that was tough. Um, and then there were some communities that just have a lot of controversy around them. And so they're quite, quite careful and selective around who they invite in. Fox hunting was an example of that. So that was quite a tough community. You know, no one wants a journalist to come and hang out with them for, for a way. I feel like they passed my emails around like a grenade. Like you know, nobody wanted to. Um, again, I ended up using a connection of a connection to, to get into that world. Um, but some of them more difficult than others. Morris dancing surprisingly was tough because most of the Morris dancing sides are all male. And I got emails back saying, sadly, if we started to let women in, too many people would leave. <laughs> this is kind of like stuck in time group. Um, I did want to do the Masons. Again, that was difficult to get in being a that, woman. That would have been a very interesting experience, yeah. I would imagine. It wouldn't have been the challenge with that is that's a book in itself, I think, rather than a chapter in a book. You know, the work that I would have to yeah. do to really get into that community and like infiltrate it to the level that I'd want to is a whole book. So there, there are ones that were challenging, but it was um, generally people are evangelical about what they do. So the vast majority of the groups having interest from somebody outside of their group was exciting. They loved, they wanted to share the joy of what it is that they do with other people. So the vast majority of communities I reached out to were like overwhelmingly welcoming to me. I think it's interesting when I asked you the question, you initially said you wanted to document your experiences in a book. Why did you choose the, the written form 
And were there kind of any sort of ideas of maybe documenting it as a, a documentary film or a radio documentary? Did that kind of maybe spring to mind as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to go back and do that. I have no access to, to that world. So I guess that was a big part of it. The taking along a dictaphone and a pen and a, a pen and paper was a much easier proposition to me. And I also felt that it could have changed the experience. I did get approached by a couple of, of, of documentary makers because um, I blogged about this at the time and a few people picked up on the blog and, and were interested. So the, the, the honest answer is at first that I just thought it was more accessible for me to write about this than it was to you know, learn how to be a videographer and, or get other um, organizations involved to document it. But then also there were some of these, um, some of these groups and specific experiences that were very intimate and it would have definitely would have changed the experience if I'd have had a camera along with me. The, you know, the intentional community, the kind of hippie commune that I lived on um, would have been very different. The nudists, I was spent a week as a, as a naturist. Um, they definitely don't let video cameras come in. Potentially, I did actually record everything on a dictaphone. So I have a ton of material that I could, if I wanted to go back one day and create like a podcast or something from that material. So that's an option. But it just felt like the most accessible uh, way for me to document it. You've mentioned already some of the, the groups you shared experience, experiences with on your journey. And you've mentioned that in total, there were 26 different subcultures. Which experiences were the most memorable and why? And were there any moments that were disappointing or did not turn out as expected? So standout experiences for me, one of them was LARPing, live action role play. You may have seen people in Bristol running around Lee Woods dressed as elves and goblins with foam swords. I don't know. I'm not far away from Lee Woods. It's literally 10 minutes up the road, but I've never come across Never seen this. any LARPers? But when I go away from this conversation with you, I shall be... Uh, doing some research you should do it's yeah. good fun it is it's about the geekiest thing you could possibly do it's like a video game acted out in real life um so it's i went to a larping event in um a scout camp there were about a thousand larpers at this event so it's and the funny thing is i didn't know anything about this world i was leaving my house all packed up with my like tankards and my costumes to go to this event and we had a plumber in doing our dishwasher at the time. And I said, oh, bye, Dave, you know, I'm off, I'm off to this thing. He's like, oh, where are you going? I said, you wouldn't know about it, LARPing. He was like, oh my God, are you going to the ritual of magic, the renewal of magic? I said, yes, it turns out like he's a LARPer. So it's, it's amazing, like these kind of clandestine communities that once you discover them, you realize that there are, there's a huge amount, there's like a vast majority of the, not majority, but a big group of the population do it. And there's connections. It might be people you know that are kind of in the closet about what it is that they do because it's seen as being geeky or um, in some way, for some reason, they don't want to share it. So that was really fun. But it's what you do is you go to these big events and you dress up um, as you physically represent a character. So you, you choose what your character is going to be. This event, you can have events that are you know, Star Wars themed events that are, this one was a fantasy event. So it's kind of like being in Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. And then you have different factions within that. So you have the elves, you have the goblins, you have, I was a knight. Um, you have like magical people, you have um, beast, beast men who are like half person, half uh, animal. And so you physically represent those characters. And then you have a st vague storyline over the weekend and you have battles and you have like foam swords and, and various different um, weapons. And uh, then you have rituals and there's kind of loose, like being in a video game, there's loose rules about how you can behave, but it's a lot of improvisation. There's a lot of drinking honestly as well, which is probably why I had such a good time, but it was, um, that was a theme throughout the book. Brits loved it. in all of these subcultures, drinking was a real theme, which maybe we'll get onto. Um, but you would go, you know, you'd be entertained by another, you'd go along with the queen and be entertained by another faction. They'd have like a pig on a spit roast. And like, there was a, a, um, a, a pub, like a, a um, in character pub tavern where they had like people playing like the lutes and things all around. And you would drink mead out of tank. It was just like 
being like an escape, like being in another time or being in like medieval times. And you could try on a different version of yourself. So, you know, we go on holiday now and we carry the same kind of crap around with us, right? Emotion, like mentally and emotionally. Yes, we might go sit on the beach, but we're still in our brain churning over like that crap thing that happened in work last week or, you know, your relationship with your in-laws or whatever. You go to something like this and you can just be a different person for the weekend. It's like pure escapism. And also adult play. Like we don't play as adults. We don't get to do that. It seems really silly. Kind of felt like we were the kids in, at the end of Lord and the Fly, a Lord of the Flies, you know, when they were all kind of the adults come along. I was waiting for the adults to come along and be like, what are you doing? But it was fun. It was, I didn't expect to love it, but I had the time of my life. Like so incredible. I didn't consider myself as a very geeky person before, but now I would go to another LARP in a heartbeat. Interestingly, as, as individuals, when we put ourselves in situations that are kind of outside of what we find comfortable, which is kind of what you're doing, I guess, associating with different groups, different communities, were there any moments where you were kind of mixing with people or groups that you just felt uncomfortable with or couldn't relate to in some sort of way or did, did that happen on your journey as well I know you, you mentioned yes. some of yeah some were uncomfortable in the sense that it was new to me naturism right it's very outside of my comfort zone it was very outside of my comfort zone to be naked in public it's just something that is can we're conditioned to do from you know very very early age is wear clothes when you're in public so that was tough to get through the people were very welcoming and I didn't ever feel uncomfortable in the social environment but it was a definitely a, um, a testing experience for me which actually was um again very positive in the sense that like my body confidence improved so much because he realized that everyone's got the same stuff and in the way everyone's very different and that's kind of okay and all these images that you're fed from like the body beautiful industry are just kind of made up and airbrushed and aren't real so it was it was actually a really really positive experience in that sense um and then there were communities that it was, I think I was, being out of your comfort zone is difficult. Being a stranger in another person's world is difficult. And you asked me before, I'm, I, I um, neglected to answer around anything that was disappointing. Nothing was disappointing, but some were very challenging. And I did, I wish they were just very, very different to me. And it's not that they weren't welcoming. It's just that it was, um, a different world. The circus was just a very, very different world. Like I, I lived in a caravan with the circus performers for a week. And that was actually one of the first um, chapters that I did. So I was kind of new to being out of my comfort zone. And for those guys, it's a, it's not even like a hobby that they do at the weekends. It's a profession and a lifestyle and it's, um, it's how they live. So being an outsider and that we're always bugging people and asking them questions all the time and never really feeling like you fit in is challenging. Um, but again, not no, to no fault of theirs, they were very welcoming. It's just tough to be a, a stranger in another person's world. Um, the one that didn't, the one that least resonated, well, there were two that didn't resonate with me. One was train spotting, which outside of it not resonating with me, it's just not my jam. I just don't like train spotting. But the experience was super interesting. Like I really enjoyed, that's one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, just from a like personal journey perspective, it's a really, I think it's a good chapter. And the other one, but I just don't enjoy chain spotting, but the other one was um, Ease for Essex, which is more Taui. It's not, you know, Essex is just a county, but it's more this idea of Taui. So I went with, with a group of girlfriends and, you know, we got fake tans and vajazzles and the, the full, fake eyelashes, the full shebang. And we went to all the clubs and we met with a few of the characters from, from The Only Way is Essex. Um, and again, just not my jam. Like mm. fun, but I just couldn't access. I'm just not into dressing up and I'm not into um, looking glam. It's just not my thing. So I just was like really struggling to relate. And in a lot of these um, scenarios, I wouldn't prepare questions in advance. Like when I went to, to the battery and actors and interviewed the battery and actors, I didn't have to prepare questions because they were just so interesting to me. Like the questions kind of fell out, but I found in the, in the Towie chapter, I really struggled to, just because it's not a natural interest for me or a value for me, I really struggled to um, be able to come up with interesting questions in that environment. So 
all the communities were great, but there are ones that are just, we of course all have natural affinities with, with different, different types of people. Next, we talk about the publication of the book mm -hmm. called A Year in the Life, Adventures in British Subcultures. How did the publishing deal happen? And what's the reaction been like? And what opportunities has it brought? Yeah, so I was um, published by a company called Unbound. And it's a crowdsourced publishing platform, which is, I'm really lucky to have found. So what this is, is it's very challenging to get published as a first time author, particularly I wasn't, you know, I'm not a writer. I still don't even really consider myself to be a writer. Um, so unless you are, have like a huge social media following, which I tried for a bit, but it's, it's tough. You have to be you know, into it and on it all the time. Um, or you're a celebrity, you know, that's releasing a biography or something, or you're an author and this is their you know, second, third book. It's very, very hard to get published. So what Unbound do is where they believe there is a market for a book, but it's unproven, they will set up a platform for you to crowdsource to publish that book. So what that means is I created a video, like this is what my book's about. Um, this is uh, why I think you find it interesting. If you're interested in it, pledge for it in advance. So kind of like a Kickstarter campaign. So people would say it was, you know, 10 bucks or whatever, 10 pounds um, to buy the book. People would pledge that in advance and say, this looks interesting. I think I want to buy it. And they pay that money up front. Then once you, and you kind of run a campaign around it. And then once you hit the threshold for the, you cover your costs to publish the book, the book goes into publication. So that covers the you know, the, um, the, there's so many rounds of edit, the developmental edit, the copy edit, the legal edit, the, um, uh, what was it called when it looks nice on a page, whatever that's called, that edit. There's so many different rounds and so many different costs involved. Marketing, uh, the actual printing of the book and all the kind of stuff, the, the cover designs so are having an artist, paying an artist to do the cover design. So all those elements are put into a kind of a final price and that's what you have to raise in pre-pledges. And then once you raise that, it goes into publication and then it's published like any other book. So then it goes onto the shelves of, you know, it's, it's being sold at Waterstone, all, all the big bookstores in the UK um, and on Amazon and every other kind of platform that you can think of. And from there, it becomes a, just a classic published book. What, how's it done? Well, surprisingly well. It still amazes me. I expected it to be something that my friends and family would read, honestly, and was kind of fine with that because I got to have these amazing experiences um but now I get like random messages on insta all the time being like oh hey I read your book I saw it I found it on the bookshelf I mean that blows my mind like word of mouth is one thing that people that just walk past and find it is, is kind of crazy so that's lovely to have and I always ask them like how did you find it because I'm always convinced it was like my mum told them to buy it you know <laughs> so yeah now I've had some great responses I've done a bunch of interviews had um lots of people reach out for interviews like this podcasts um uh press interview i've been in the, the guardian um in some in the mirror in the bristol live paper so people are interested and it's very surprising i don't know that it's necessarily opened up any opportunities yet i haven't really leaned into it in that way but um i'd love to write another book and do it again at some point we'll watch the space and yeah who knows maybe hollywood might come call in right. one day you never know never know you mate you never know we talk about this extraordinary journey that resulted in documenting the whole experience in book form, which we've discussed at some length. Now we come on to a very different chapter in your life. And I want to cast the clock back now to 2018. And you're involved in a traumatic motorbike accident, which nearly cost you your life. And you took a year to recover. Can you recall the accident and what are your memories of that day? And second to that, can you talk about the recovery process and how you managed to cope with that day to day? Yes, um, I actually really enjoy talking about it. Strange, isn't it? It's, it's kind of cathartic for me. And as well as being a really difficult experience in so many ways, there's been a ton of um, 
great things that have come out of it and perspective and joy. Um, so yes, I was commuting to work in uh, across the Bay Bridge in, in San Francisco on my motorcycle and my husband was behind me on his motorcycle. And about 8 a.m. in the morning, somebody coming in the other direction was coming back from a night shift and fell asleep at the wheel, just kind of slumped onto her wheel and just swerved into me and, and hit me head on. So it was like a, I was doing 30, she was doing 30, like a 60 mile per hour head on collision. So very serious. I remember thinking, oh shit, darn, my lad say shit, I don't know. Um, I actually thought something worse than that, but I'm sure you can guess. I remember thinking this is this thing is gonna happen. You, you, can, um, you can say it, you're allowed to. Excuse me, I'm allowed to? Oh fuck, is what I remember, yes, oh fuck. And uh, so this something's gonna happen, it's gonna be terrible. Um, and then from there, vaguely remember being, I flipped over the car multiple times. It actually happened outside a, a liquor store, so America, off license. And there was a camera, a security camera. So we have the whole thing on, on security cameras and I've since watched it and it's like, it's like an action movie. Um, I broke my neck, my back, my pelvis in multiple places, my arm, my shoulder, kind of tore myself open, lost a lot of blood on the road. It was, it was a shouldn't have survived kind of scenario. And I remember being on the road, I was still conscious, um, kind of in and out. And I remember my husband was obviously had dropped his bike. He didn't get hit, but he was there. So poor guy and him kind of comforting me. And then I remember being taken into the, uh, ER, the a and &E by ambulance and arriving and then like everyone flocking to me, kind of like in a movie as well. Everyone runs to you and starts tearing at your clothes and shouting things to each other. Suspected this, 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 we need this, this, this. And I remember going into what must have been a, um, a one of those round scanning machines, a CAT scan, one of those round scanning machines. And it was like light, like bright light going into a tunnel of light. So I kind of didn't know where I was in and out. Didn't really know what was going on, but in my head, I was like, "Oh, this is it!" Like I'm, the, the, I'm walking toward the perception of of dying and going yeah. up to the, the pearly gates in the sky, as they as they exactly say. that. And you know what? It's real. There was a strange piece about that. Like I, whenever I talk about this experience, it's like this feeling. You know, when you have just done an exam at school and you come out and you can just like tear up your book, like I never have to do that again. I never have to think about algebra again and you can kind of burn all your textbooks or whatever. It's like that feeling the like yeah. the the kind of responsibilities of life are no longer mine to bear. And because I've been so lucky, I've had such a great life and so many experiences. It was like a ah, like a kind of euphoria in a really strange way. Um but then as I went into this machine, I had this real memory of being like, oh crap, what about my friends and family? Like, what about all these people I love having to go through this trauma, you know, if I was to die? And, and it was, it's real like, oh, this is really peaceful. And like, maybe it's time and maybe that's okay. Combined with this like fear of just the amount of upset that it would cause. And I, I don't know, maybe I've reframed it in this way, but I kind of feel like that's what kept me here was the like, I need to live because I don't want to make my mum cry. Um, so uh, something to do with that anyway. And then I was kind of in and out for a, a while. I was in ICU intensive care for, um, for a long time, had to have a colostomy, which they later reversed, had to, had a bunch of like internal fixators and metal fixators and uh, uh, external fixators on my pelvis and I was in neck brace and lots of blood and uh, that they had to give me. So that was a long part of the recovery. And then I went to, had to be transferred to another hospital for a few weeks um, as a, like an inpatient there. And then they sent me home for six weeks and I was on a hospital bed in my front room because I had to stay horizontal while my bones healed, um, but I didn't need to be in hospital. So I had this like Hoyer lift thing that would lift me into this like reclining wheelchair. And that was like my life for, uh, for six weeks. And then I went into rehab. So it was like a physical rehab center and just the daily grind of like moving the, the, my toes on my left foot and all the various like stages of recovery to stand sitting up was the first big thing I had my first shower in three months that was like so exciting and then um of course leading to learning to walk again which took me a long time and there wasn't they didn't really know how my body was going to respond after all of the injuries um I had a lot of numbness in my left side and a 
foot drop and just real weakness. So they didn't know how I was going to, um, going to respond to that. But I had my wedding planned a year, just less than a year after the accident. So my goal was to be able to walk down the aisle at my wedding. Like that was my, and I got married on a beach. So I had to walk on sand in barefoot, which to a physio is like the hardest thing you could possibly do. So that was my goal that kept me going. And, and I got there, you know, I, it was a long process and a painful process, but also a very life affirming process. I wanted to delve a little bit into the recovery and rehabilitation process because throughout our conversation, you've given me the impression that you're somebody highly driven, had a, a very successful job at senior high level corporate world. You obviously had a lot of drive to do what you did in terms of documenting your life journey with different subcultures. For someone so highly driven and with such a, a can-do, get-things-done attitude, it must have been exceedingly hard to literally go through that painstaking process of recovery. Did you find it particularly hard? Were there moments where maybe depression or anxiety crept in? And I also wanted to ask you, did you ever meet the other driver involved in the accident? Yeah. Um, it's actually a, a really interesting question because, because I definitely agree with you. I kind of tend to lean into life, like to a fault, uh, as in like always trying to be productive, having lots of to-do lists, ticking things off, wanting to get things done, getting caught in that cycle and not therefore struggling to be kind of content in the moment. That's, that's always something I've struggled with. Um, this the experience of the accident was like kind of hitting the pause button. And that was kind of great in a way because it forced me to be in the moment, like to be in that hospital room where I couldn't see my phone to text back people. I couldn't like, I didn't have to remember people's birthdays. Like I didn't have to be achieving anything. I didn't have to be making progress with my professional career, publicizing the book, whatever it was. I didn't have to be, doing any of this there were no ex the only expectations of me were that I had to like wriggle my toes on my left foot by the end of the day or like eat a mouthful of jelly like that was like well that was a great day if I ate a mouthful of jelly so there's again there's like a piece in that and it's embarrassing to admit that it took that something like that to enable me to be in the moment more so and just to enjoy the small things like the First time I got wheeled around in this wheelchair after like, you know, a month or so of just being stationary, feeling the, the air move on my face was something I never even knew was like a joy, but was like so overwhelmingly exciting for me. So that was, that's why I say it was in some ways a really positive experience is I got to do that. So actually the not having to, the not having that, um, self-pressure which is what it is really it's not pressure from other people it's self-pressure to be productive and be working towards something to have that lifted was um was great <laughs> it was like a really a really good time in my life um and a lesson that I try and hold on to um the normal creeps back in again of course then you forget these lessons but I, I do try and hold on to that so yeah, it was, well, it was tough. The physical recovery was tough. I knew exactly what was expected with me and it was, I could achieve it. And I knew it just took grit to get it done. So, so it wasn't, um, wasn't as, as hard. Uh, have I met the woman that hit me? Yes, I have. There was um, uh, a legal case, you know, an insurance case um, with her. And so I was in the room with her, with our lawyers and, and we got to meet and, I feel no animosity towards her whatsoever. She actually had a very, has a very difficult life, um, much more difficult than mine and was exhausted coming back from a night shift, just an accident, honestly, and had her baby in the car with her, like just really, really terrible for her as well. So um, yeah, I'd like to get to know her better and, uh, and, and meet up with her and spend time with her. I don't know if that's going to happen, but yeah. And a near death experience, do you think it's, changed your philosophy about life and has it made you kind of live your life in a very different way than before the accident? If I would like it to have affected my life more than it has. Um, and I actually, 
would like to as a as a next book I would really like to interview people who have had big traumas in their life to see how they've maintained that perspective that you get you know at the time you're like I'm never going to sweat the small stuff anymore like you know I was going through stupid silly little dramas like we were getting married and you know you fight with your in-laws about how many people you can invite and just silly things that you think are really important at the time and then you nearly die you're like oh my god who cares that like it all comes from love everyone just wants to so you do have that amazing perspective but then over time you know normality just creeps back in again and you kind of forget these lessons so there are things some things that have stayed with me um I think I do still have good perspective and don't tend to get too tied up in in things that aren't important um so an element of that has stayed with me but I'd like it to be fresher than it is and I think some people are just much better at holding on to that so a big project that I want to get involved in is like what have you because some people completely change their lives right they go through an experience like that and they just want to give back I think there's a pressure actually when you go through something like that that you do because you've been given a second chance at life you want to really make the most of that and kind of grab at it and so some people like decide to throw it all in and work for an amazing charity or just do something really profound um so yeah I'd like to interview and learn from those people because I feel like I've learned some lessons but there wasn't a profound shift in my life and then it can kind of feel like you put everyone through this really difficult time for nothing yeah if you haven't made that big profound shift so I'm kind of playing with that idea right now one thing we haven't spoken about so far is that you're a married woman with a young daughter how did you meet your husband And what are your main interests in life and why? So I actually have two sons now. (laughs) So I have a um, two and a half year old and uh, and now I have a a, a six month, well, no, it's not, it's eight month old as well now. So I have two. Uh, I met my husband here in the US. Um, He's French. So I came all the way to the US to meet a Frenchman. We met at a European networking, a professional networking event, which is like, about as unromantic as it gets we exchange he, messages he works in the same capacity he works like yes exactly he moved to, he moved from france to san francisco with his company and i moved from the uk to san francisco with my company and we met at this this europeans in the bay networking event so that's how we met um gosh nearly seven years ago now and uh then yeah we had off uh, we got married off year after the accident and then i had my first son two and a half years ago and my second son quite recently. So um, yeah, they keep me very, very busy actually. It's a, it's an identity shift when you have kids, right? You just, you, um, and I'm still, I'm still in that right now. I'm still figuring that out. Like what is this new, this current chapter, this new version of myself? Like who do I want to be as a mom and how do I, how much of yourself do you sacrifice? Yeah. If you think about it all in circles, you have like your, hobbies your professional life your life as a mother and you and the life as a mother circle is very very big and kind of almost all encompassing right now because I just have two tiny dependent children who I love dearly I love being a mom but I'm still figuring that out like I still miss you know you miss who you were before you miss I miss the adventurer I miss spending my life with 26 subcultures I still have hobbies I sing in an acapella group I um sit on a, a couple of boards and goodness me what else do I do I don't know I would like to do more of I'd like to ride used to ride horses I'd like to do that again and um do more of this kind of stuff and and, and get deep and meaningful I think uh a lot of your day as a as a mom particularly of young kids is like physical it's like a, a bit it can be a bit of a trudge you can just like changing diapers and cleaning up and cooking food so this, I have to accept that that's this chapter of my life and maybe as they get older, I will have a bit more time and bandwidth to do other things. One final question and we move, move on to that moment. Mm. Lucy, where we ask all your take guests the same 13 questions, hey. just wrap up the interview, kind of find out things that maybe we haven't learned through the course of the interview, hobbies, interests, things you like to do in a, another lifetime all kinds of things like that. So we'll find that out in just a minute. But my final question is, what is the next chapter or adventure in your life? And from your experiences so far, 
and we've established that there's been many. What has your journey taught you about the world, yourself, or even about the human condition? Wow, that is a big, <laughs> how long do we have? Like, <laughs> geez. How, how, long, how long have you got? Well, um, what's next? Um, next, I guess, has to be this chapter of, of being a mom, honestly, of, of figuring mm. that out. Um, certainly for the next couple of years, um, settling into that, I think, is, is something that I need to do. Not, not being um, averse to it, but really settling into it and owning it. I think that's what I'd like to do more of. And then I'd love to write this other book, this um, when the normal creeps back in, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Accidents is the working title. Um, something like that, it's just another, another experience. I also love the idea of doing the A to Z that I did of subcultures for, for jobs, like really understanding, particularly jobs that are very interesting and different and, and we might not know exist, you know, I love, I love lifting the lid on clandestine things that no one really knows what they do, like, I don't know taxidermists or just something that's out there and is real or you don't even really think about as being a job and then you go and discover this whole world that you didn't know existed so that's really appealing um and then my husband and I really want to buy a big piece of land and go out there and build what we're going to call an experience center where we have like a escape room and maybe themed rooms like the LARPing thing comes in here as well like maybe we'd have like fantasy themed room Harry Potter themed rooms or something we have like ideas that we're playing with around there what did I learn so much about myself that I love thrive on being out of my comfort zone I love it I love I love strangers I love talking to new people um and I really miss that during the pandemic I feel like those moments of like serendipity that just pop up, they're unplanned, people that you meet that you don't expect to. There was really none of that. Everything was very planned, right? Yes, you could hop on a Zoom with somebody, but you had to schedule it. Like it was no meeting someone new on a bus stop, meeting that like none of it had, and that is really my jam. Um, so so that is um, something I learned about myself. I just, I have to force myself to do it. You know, like sometimes it's just easier to stay on the couch and watch a movie. And you're like, I don't want to, go and be really uncomfortable and talk to, you know, these, um, this, whatever it is, I'm trying to think of a group, um, ufologists, like, I, I don't know anything about it. It's a new world. They all know each other. I'm going to feel really awkward for the first, but then you feel awkward for the first 10 minutes and then it's kind of fine. So you have to force it. I have to force myself to do it, but then when I get there, it's fine. So that's what I learned. Um, the human condition so much. We, just all strive for connection. That is at the heart of the vast majority of the groups. I mean, train spotting less so, that's more of a passion that isn't necessarily connection related, but pretty much all of the others, it's just about, it might be, you know, you might really enjoy bell ringing and that's why you go the first time to just, you like the idea of ringing bells in a, in a church and that's why you go the first time, but it's the community that keeps you there. It's that real sense of belonging. It's that like, tribalism the sense that you're part of something that you've got yeah. it's social and also being with i guess like-minded people who share a common interest a common love yeah exactly and yeah people that would my, my sense of it was it's like this kind of building these groups and these these different kind of tribes is like almost recreating village life you know we've lost that now we don't it's kind of faceless unless you live in a tiny village and you know all your neighbors we don't really share the upbringing of our children with people. We don't, it's not that same sense that they used to be. Whereas when we're creating these communities, we do get to do that. We get to relive in that again. So that's a real, um, was a real thread for me. And also that you get extremes on both sides. Again, this, this idea of the truth is in the middle. You get people who are very militantly pro something like the naturists, you know, you get people who are militantly pro believe everybody should be naked all the time and like campaign for that like clothes are irrelevant like they feel very very strongly about that um and then you get the people that like accept the tribe for what it is and don't take it too seriously and aren't too militant about it and on both sides you know you get the very militant pro fox hunters and the very militant anti-hunters and just my favorite people were the ones who were just 
in these communities, but self-aware enough to be know that there are other things out there and curious and curious enough to know that there are other things out there. And they didn't necessarily think that their way of life was like the best way. And, and it was like the true way and the right way to live. But they were accepting and tolerant of other groups. So um, you will always find extremists in any group. Like it might surprise you, you find extreme goths like, um, who hate anyone that's not a goth. You know, it's, it's rare, but you do get them in every single community. And my favorite people were the ones that were just like, they get it. They get that this is a, they love it. They're committed to the tribe, but they get that it's not necessarily the only way of being. Lucy, Leonelli, we move, move on to the final chapter of the interview. Every single guest on your take has been asked these same questions. They're the last 13, they're kind of quick fire questions. So don't think about these in any detail. Okay. Here we go, Lucy. Number one, what would you say is your favorite pastime? Horse riding. My biggest love next is the cinema. Wanted to ask, what is your favorite film and why? My favorite film is Lord of the Rings, which is a trilogy, so that's a cheat answer, but it's Lord of the Rings. And the reason is I really enjoy the earthiness of it and the like, like harking back to a simpler time and the binary, you know what's right and wrong. There's good and there's evil and you know which side you're on. And I like that. I wish the world was more like that. From JR talking to Peter Jackson's um, film adaptations you move on to writing now and you say you're not really a writer but you've written a book but I wanted to ask who is your favorite novelist Philip Pullman who is a young adult fiction writer he wrote um his dark materials trilogy so the northern lights the subtle knife the amber spyglass that series and what I love about that series especially I've read it so many times even as an adult is that it's almost like um a reality that's so close to our own it could be our own it's like the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality it's almost like an overlay on our reality where if we were to have taken a slightly different path that's where we'd be lucy if you could have had a different profession what would it have been i would be louis theroux a journalist, yeah. <laughs> documentary maker. I would choose the same profession as well. I think I would have loved to have been a journalist, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Parkinson, maybe in another lifetime, but sadly, probably it still not happened. good. Um, it still happened. You never know. Um, we talk about inspiration, but who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Um, probably my mum. My mum is very, um, very patient, very open, very curious, and has like a relentless enthusiasm for uh, for trying new things. Newspapers now. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? I don't know if it counts as a newspaper, but I have a subscription to the New York Times. So I read the app, <laughs> the newspaper on an app. Uh, but it's a little depressing in the US. It's just very, very political. Like there are, we really miss, um, not that you don't have biased journalism in the UK, but it's, um, you're either one side or the other here. There's nothing, there's no, we don't have the, we don't have a BBC, for example. There's nothing that is um, supposedly unbiased. I don't know how true that is, but still it's very, very uh, either one way or the other. So I, I, I struggle. I, I get quite frustrated and outraged. Do you still follow the news this side of the pond? And do you, you know, look on the, the BBC website, for example? Do you look at any of the British newspapers? I do, yes. My um, good friend is an editor at a newspaper, so I do. I always read her, her, her um, articles. And I read bits and bobs, just things that really jump out at me. I guess I subscribe to The Telegraph and The Guardian, so I have news articles pop up at me there. But... Um, I don't really have an affinity with one paper. Food next. What would you say is your favourite food? Sausages. It's something that's really hard to get a good sausage in the US. Very British as well. 
very when I come back to the UK the first thing I will I go to Greg's and I get like a sausage sandwich that is like my dream because sausage sausages here are kind of like frankfurters you know like the, the pre kind. rubbery yeah not like proper British bangers not like your bangers and mash yeah like bangers and mash now the next one always stumps a lot of our guests we ask them to choose a favorite cultural icon it could be an activist maybe a political figure maybe someone who's changed the course of history or an inventor or who would you choose I would choose, that's a good question. I would choose Bernie Sanders. Um, might be some recency bias because I've lived in the US for a while now, but he is someone who challenges the, he's relentless again in, in his challenge of like the, the, the paradigm in the US and the system, the like purely capitalist system. And is being like, he's in his 80s now. And I mean, he's still, you know, ran for president in the last election. He's still trying, he's still chipping away at it. And he believes in like outrageous things like free healthcare for all and free education for all, which like in the UK is a given in the US is like socialist. You know, you are, uh, you're a left wing crazy socialist. So, but he keeps it flying and he keeps on going. And it has, he's made some great wins along the way. Curse words next. What is your favourite curse word and why? Uh, it's probably bloody because Americans love, I can get away with it here. It's not all a swear word here and Americans love it. When you say it, they think it's hilarious. So I say it like at least five times a day in like professional emails, I'll say it. You're a busy, busy lady, but when you have time to relax or go on holiday, what would you say is your favourite place or holiday destination? My, I love to come home. Most of my holidays are going back to the UK and going home. Um, so I, and when I go home, I love to do proper, I guess, American touristy version of home. I love to go to like little villages like the Cotswolds or Devon and just see that beautiful, what we, what I really miss is that meadows, the greenery, the like the countryside, hundred different shades of green of the British countryside. Yeah. It's just unparalleled anywhere else in the world. It's, it's beautiful. We probably take that for granted as as Brits, don't we? The the beautiful kind of English rural countryside, that almost Thomas Hardy picturesque version from that vision from his famous classic novels. We move on next to to music. You briefly spoke about a love of music and being in a a cappella group, but who is your favourite music artist and what would you cite as your favourite album? My favorite music artist is probably Don McLean. I really like kind of this troubadour um, like concept of the bard, of like storytelling. Mm -hmm. So anybody like that, who's like a, I would put like, you know, Paul Simon, James Taylor, um, who else would I put in that? Gosh, there are so many, but anyone that kind of te- country music is really good at this, but like really tells a story with their with their music is um is appealing. So Don McLean is just uh, he's a poet in, from my perspective. And my favorite album is probably Kate Bush. The whole story. She's in the charts again now. Yeah, and interestingly, I listened to her interview um, on the BBC Radio. I think it was Radio Five Live the other day. Uh, talking about it being number one, running up that hill and, you know, discovering a a new audience with the, obviously the Stranger Things popular television series, but an incredible artist. I like your choice about songsmiths who are almost narrative storytellers. I think Don McLean's an interested choice because his most famous story is a story about a rock and roll icon who died at such a young, young age in one of my favorite artists actually buddy holly so yeah Yeah. interesting choice um lucy the final two questions what would you say first is your greatest achievement to date i should say my kids but they're not an achievement you're like i created them but they're not human like fully formed humans yeah i'd like to say that when they are fully 
form humans, they will be my greatest achievement because I will have parented them well. Um, but I think it, it has to be the book, honestly, is getting the book published because that was a, it was a slog. It was tough. I had no idea what I was doing. I was making it up as I went along. I um, had like a bunch of resistance, like in the sense that people didn't really see it as a real thing or kind of get it. It was like a, you know, like a gap year versus trying to really make something of it. And the having to like approach hundreds and hundreds of different people for some of the letters until I finally got someone that bit. And then the getting it published was, was a long journey as well, the work that I had to, to put into doing that. So I think that was, yeah, that's probably what I'd point to. And finally, Lucy Leonelli, how do you wish to be remembered? I wish to be remembered as being open and curious. I feel like um, curiosity is the most valuable thing we can, uh, I hope to teach my kids is the not being rigid and not just living in your own bubble, but really wanting to understand the world outside of that. And Lucy, the end chapter of tonight's interview, but not the final chapter in your life. I wanted to thank you for taking the last 60 plus minutes out of your day and being a guest and talking to me and sharing your life experience. It's been interesting for a number of reasons. There's been some kind of similarities, both from the same city, places you've mentioned that I know very well. And I think the interesting thing is you, the whole subculture and talking about that in some depth, it's been interesting because over the course of the last year, I've interviewed musicians, songwriters, a glamour model, um authors but tonight's interview has been completely different for many reasons than anyone else I've interviewed totally different life experience very interesting to hear about your life in the corporate world and all your successes and also doing something completely on the flip side of that and taking a year out of your life and sharing that journey with us I wish you continued success with the book, of course. I hope maybe other opportunities come off the back of that narrative. And finally, can you tell us where we can buy the book and where we can find out more about your story? Yeah, thank you. And it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the book, Google, A Year in the Life, Adventures in British Subcultures, or my name, Lucy Leonelli, and it, it should pop up so you can get it in I think most of the bookstores, most of the big bookstores and some of the indies um, in the UK on, or on Amazon, Blackwell's online, anywhere like that. I'm looking forward, hopefully, to maybe the next story, the next book, the next documentary, who knows, maybe a film, but I wish you all the best and thank you once again. Thank you so much. 